You are listening to WTUZ Radio Podcast. To WTUZ Radio Podcast. I am your host, Rhonda, and today's topic is the last installment in our series. Um, as we go over the Moen Hand report, the, 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 the decline and destruction of the Black families, the Moen Hand report. This is part five. Uh, if you have not joined us for this series, this particular report was published in 1964, and it goes over uh, the health of the Black family using data from the census from 1940 through 1963. Uh, in this particular report, it dives into the root issues of things that are going on in the Black community that still go on in the Black community today. Uh, let me share my screen with you all. Just a second here, bring a little technology into it. Okay, so uh, this is the case for national action, <clears throat> the Negro family. Okay, so uh, you can see it was the Office of Policy Planning and Research United States Department of Labor. It was published in 1965, I guess. And it's called the Moen Hen Report because it, I guess, was put together by a man named Moen Hen. Okay, so I'll let you look at some of the table of content. Uh, okay, as you can see, it went over some of the history. And then it gets into the family dynamics, uh, the uh, black marriages, which was really, really interesting to me when it went over the data in the 1940s. I had no idea going that far back what was going on. It got into also the birth uh, of black children as it relates to being married or unmarried. And that's still the conversation that's being had today on single motherhood. Again, I had uh, no idea that it was that high in that time frame. Okay. <sighs> this is another one that kind of really blew me away. Uh, discussing black families headed by women. Again, based on the time frame from the 1940s to 1963, I had no idea that those numbers would be that high. Um, and again, that's a, yet another topic that's still talked about in the Black community. The next one is the breakdown of the Negro family and the increased dependency on welfare. Now, this one <laughs> is literally used as talking points by some Black men on why the destruction of the Black family is taking place today. Literally, the welfare system is being used as a talking point, which the talking point itself does not make sense because if a welfare check, which literally keeps a woman and children in poverty, can take a black man out of the home, that is very telling. I don't think black men realize what they're literally saying when they make statements that a welfare check took black men out the home, that a welfare check is the reason why black families are destroyed. I don't really think they understand what they are saying. But nonetheless, uh, here it is in this particular report on how the dependency of welfare started. Okay. 
And just a side note, welfare was never intended for children with parents. So that would include single motherhood. Welfare was started for orphan children. Children that had neither parent. So let me back that up. Welfare was originally started for orphans, meaning children without a mother or a father taking care of them. Welfare had to be extended to include parents with children based on folk, not adults, parents not being able to take care of their children, okay? And the data specifically says in the black community, the welfare dependency happened because of black men not being in the household. The number says that black men not being in the household is based on desertion. And when you get to the root cause of desertion, it goes back to finances. Black men not being able to financially support their families. Now that is what the root data says. Now, whether or not you agree with the data, that is certainly your right to do that. All I ask is bring something in comparison. If you do not agree with the data, and that's fine. I Hey, I understand it. If your logic is that is comparing it to white people, okay, that's fine. Bring some data where we can discuss these root issues, not opinions, not your experience, not what this one says, what that one says on an individual level, what the people that you've talked to actually bring some data, some statistics, which would have to comprise of some type of study with a sample size of the black population and let us know what other group you are comparing that to, okay? That's how we are supposed to have these conversations. It's okay not to agree if you don't trust someone else's data. That's fine. Go do the research and bring back an equivalent study going over each one of these points. And I would be more than happy to go through that information and do a series on it. And I would even compare what you bring to this mowing hand report. All right. So then it uh, went into some of the root causes. Now, I did not cover slavery. Uh, and I didn't cover slavery because that would require me to go into all of slavery. And that would have made this series a lot longer than necessary, okay? I didn't go over that. I didn't go over Reconstruction either. I don't think I did. We did get into urbanization, how urbanization uh, came into play. That's what the study got into. Uh, then it touched on to, now remember, these are root causes of the problem. Then it went into unemployment and poverty, the wage system, and um, how all of these, unemployment and poverty and the wage system, it keeps growing. And as we are here in 2021, this report still rings true regarding the state of the black community. Okay. 
Now, uh, the next one we went over, which, ooh, chow. I'll never be the same on this one. Their definition of the state of the black community being a matriarchal, I never, never, ever, 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 ever would have thought of it this way. Um, very, very interesting why they say it's a matriarchal and the failure thereof of the black community. Okay, then it gets into uh, the failure of the youth. So the impact, the impact of all of the roots problems is specifically the reason of the failure of the youth, delinquency, and crime. And again, these are the exact same issues that the black community is dealing with today. Okay. Now, the other part of the report, uh, it went into, because uh, in part four, we uh, I think we finished up in delinquency and crime. And we talked about the armed forces and the armed forces. They're really going into how that is an out quote, quote, an out or an alternative for black men to have a career, okay? Um, and so now in this final part, we're going to go into alienation and uh, the case for national action. So let's go into the alienation part, okay? So again, I'm just going to reiterate doesn't matter to me if folks have a problem with this report. That is your right to do so. Show me the data. Show me the study. Show me the stats. That are similar. And I would be more than happy to go through those stats do a series on those stats and compare those stats to this mowing hand report. Now remember, your stats have to hit on all of the root causes and the impacts. And your study, your stats also have to compare it to something, okay? So if you don't want to compare it to white America, then you have to specify what you are comparing it to, okay? Otherwise, you're not really wanting to have a serious conversation. You want to go in defense mode. And this is not about defending. It's about what's accurate and what's not. So again, if something is not accurate, please provide the data, please provide the statistics to show that it is not accurate. The purpose of this series is for each and every person in the black community, and it doesn't matter if I come up here and say black, Negro, colored, African-American, indigenous American, we're not children. I certainly am not one to be played with. You know exactly who this is talking about. The purpose of this series is for each person in the black community to take this report and have serious conversations. That's among each other. That's with your family members, specifically with your children, with your grandchildren. For men to take the report and have the conversation among men, you don't even have to have women included in it and for women to do the same. 
All right, so let's get into alienation. Or not, or not. You don't have to do, do either. Trust me, you don't have to do either. That's another option as well. All right, so alienation. The term alienation may by now have been used in too many ways to retain a clear meaning, but it will serve to sum up the equality, I'm sorry, equally, numerous ways in which large number of Negro youths appear to be withdrawn from American society. One star startling way in which this occurs is that the men are just not there when the census, I think we went over this before, when the census enumerator comes around, according to the Bureau of uh, Census, population estimates for 1963, there are only 87 black males for every 100 females in the 30 to 34 year age group. Oh, okay. So either black men are not around when the census workers come to take the data and y'all know the census because didn't we just have one last year? Honey, you could call yourself not filling that out if they want, if you want to. They're going to keep coming back to your house, keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. Keep coming back. Okay? So either there was no black men living in the household at the time that the census was around, and or they're saying there are only 87 black males for every 100 women, black women in the 30 to 34 year age group. The ratio does not exceed 90 to 100 throughout the 25 to 44 year age bracket. In the urban Northeast, there are only 76 males per 100 females, 20 to 24 years of age, and males as a percentage of females are below 90% throughout all ages after 14 there are real they, there are not really fewer men than women in the 20 to 40 age bracket what obviously is involved in error in counting the surveyors simply do not find the negro or i say black man black man Donald J. Bougie, or Bougie, and his associates who have studied the federal count of the Negro man placed the error as high as 19.8% at the age 28. A typical error of around 15% is estimated from the age 19 through uh, 43. Preliminary research in the Bureau of the Census on the 1960 enumeration has resulted in similar conclusions. Although not necessarily the same estimates of the extent of the error. The black man can be found at age 17 and 18 on the basis of birth re records and mortality records. Okay, that makes sense. The conclusion must be that he is there at age 19 as well. All right, I'm with you. When the enumerators do find him, his answers to the standard questions asked in the monthly unemployment survey often results in counting him as not in the labor force. In other words, black male unemployment may in truth be somewhat greater than reported. The labor force participation rates of non-white or black men have been falling since the beginning of the century and for the past decade have been lower than the rates for white men. In 1964, the participation rates were 78% for white men and 75% for black men, and I'm going to say 76%. Let's round it up. Almost one percentage point of this difference was due to a higher proportion of black men unable to work 
because of long-term physical or mental illness. Oh, so what was that? So 1% out of that was because of uh, physical, long-term physical or mental Ill illness. It seems reasonable to assume that the rest of the difference is due to discouragement about finding a job. Uh-oh, here we go. If black male labor force participation rates were as high as the white rates, there would have been 140,000 more black males in the labor force in 1964. If we further assume that the 140,000 would have been unemployed, the unemployment for black men would have been 11.5% instead of the recorded rate of 9%. And the ratio between the black rate and the white rate would have jumped from two to one to two to four. Child. Understand or not, the official unemployment rate for blacks are among unbelievable. The unemployment statistics for black teenagers, 29% in January, 1965 reflect lack of training and opportunity in the greatest measure, but it may not be doubted that they also reflect a certain failure of nerve. Are you looking for a job? Secretary of Labor Wirtz asked a young man on a Harlem street corner, why was the reply? Yeah, we went over this before, but I'm going over it again. Uh, Richard A. Cloward and Robert Ontel have commented on this withdrawal in a discussion of the, mobili uh, the mobilization for youth projects on the Lower East Side of New York. You know, I find that interesting because we know in Black neighborhoods <clears throat> that have high violence, you have a lot of black men, what we call standing on the corner, and you have a lot of uh, the youth either doing the same or running around in the neighborhood, okay? Now, we can just talk about today. We don't even have to bring, because this is, remember, 1964. But this is interesting, okay? Now... I can't speak for all, I cannot speak for all, and this is only based on experience and hearsay. This is not based on statistics, what I am about to say. When you do ask um, youth, you know, why are they out here doing this and that? Why don't you just get a job? And the typical answer, based on my experience and based on what others say, the youngins say they're not trying to go work and sling burgers and fries based on the amount of money they're going to get paid. Okay, never fails, but I had to leave my phone on this time. <laughs> okay, so again, that's based on, not based on statistics, it's just based on hearsay and my experience. We are plagued in work with these youths by what appears to be low tolerance for frustration. They are not able to absorb setbacks, minor irritants, and rebuffs are magnified out of all proportions of, to reality. Perhaps they react as they do because they are not equal to the world that confronts them and they know it. That part is deep to me. Perhaps they react as they do because they are not equal to the world that confronts them and they know it. Now that's not based on statistics. That's just based on an opinion. My question to the black community 
Are you ready to have those serious conversations? And it is the knowing that is devastating. Had the occupational structure remained intact or had the education provided to them kept pace with occupational changes, the situation would be a different one. But it is not. And that is what we and they have to contend with. <clears throat> Are we ready to have these serious conversations? Because really, to, to if we really want to be honest about the whole thing, there's only a couple of options. And either one of those options will require ja drastic change and drastic work. If you are of the ideology that you can't compare black folk to white folk because the system of white supremacy was built for the benefit of white men, that would mean that black men would have to build a system that they feel is for the benefit of the black community. That's the first option. I'll go over that again. If your ideology is you can't compare black folk to white folk because the white supremacist system was built for the benefit of white people, that would mean that black men have to build a system that benefits the black community. The other option is you have to compete in the said white supremacist system. And in order to do that, you have to prepare yourself. And that's regardless of the fact that you have, quote, quote, things stacked up against you. You have to come up to prepare yourself through either education, trade, entrepreneurship. So let me say that again. If you are going to compete in the white supremacist system, although we know you still have things stacked up against you, okay? Because remember, you didn't want to go to the first option, which is to build your own system. You want to compete in the white supremacy system then you have to prepare yourself. That means educate. That means having a trade. That means being an entrepreneur. Okay? That means having intact families. Because it shows not only throughout this report, but on up to today, that groups that are successful are successful because of their intact families. Now, the final option is what I hear some folk talk about on the extreme level, which is destroy the system. Okay. You want to destroy the current system, 
That means you have to have infrastructure in place to replace said system. Now, are we ready to have these conversations? Or are we still going to talk about everything but what the root issues are? But in the meantime, we have yet another generation that are literally dying, that are literally falling further and further behind. We have a quote, quote, black community where even there is a split within the black community. Because you have part of the black community that are not going to wait on the other part of the black community to pull it together. Or otherwise, they will drown or be in the same circumstances. So again, are we going to have those serious conversations? And if not, that's fine. But let's not act surprised. Let's not act shocked. When these extinction level things keep happening to said community and specifically the extinction level things with black men. So let's continue. Narcotic addiction is a characteristic form of withdrawal. In 1963, blacks made up 54% of the addiction population of the United States. Although the Federal Bureau of Narcotics reports a decline in the black proportion of new addicts, Haryu reports the addiction rate in central Harlem rose from 22 per 10,000 in 1955 to 40 in 1961. Okay, so now let's be fair with this drug addiction because now we know more, and by any mean, that's not justifying any of these numbers. But now that we know more, we know how drugs flow into the community. And we know those who are profiting the most from it are definitely way beyond the Black community. Okay? But we also have to be real. When the drugs hit the community, we have primarily black men on the front lines that are the pusher men to sell the drugs in within the black community. Okay. There is a larger, which also brings um, violence and crime. Okay. So that's its own cycle within itself. All right. There is a larger fact about the alienation of black youth in the uh, tang the tangle of pathology described by these statistics. It is a fact particularly difficult to grasp by white persons who have in recent years shown increasingly awareness of black problems. The present generation of black youth growing up in urban ghetto in the urban ghettos has probably less personal contact with the white world than any generation in the history of black America. Okay, yeah, we went over this. Sorry, but going over it again. Until World War II, it could be said that in general, the black and white worlds lived, if not together, at least side by side. Certainly they did, and they do so in the South. Okay, I think we talked about this since World War II. However, the worlds have drawn physically apart. The symbol of this development was the construction in the 1940s and 1950s of the vast white middle class and lower class suburbs around the nation's cities. Increasingly, the inner cities have been left to blacks who now share almost no community life with whites. Okay, so uh, those of us 
that are older. We already knew this history based on what uh, our parents and our grandparents told us. Uh, if you are Gen X, um, I'm assuming that your parents kind of told you all um, of that migration from your folks leaving the South, coming up North into the cities and subsequently into the projects and they came up north for work and came up north to escape the Jim Crow laws, okay? So uh, for the millennials and the Zs, if you did not know, that's how those cities were formed. That's how those cities were formed. Okay, in turn, because of this new housing pattern, most of which has been financially assisted by the federal government, it is probable that the American school system has become more rather than less segregated in the past two decades. Okay, so that should not um, surprise anyone. Okay, this particular graph is just going over the rate of narcotics users in central Harlem was eight times as high as that for New York City in 1961. Okay, ooh, that's high then. If you comparing it to all of, ooh, child, if you comparing it to all of New York City and Harlem, just the neighborhood, ooh, baby, y'all see this? That's high. That's very high. That was a lot of drugs going through Harlem. Okay, sorry family, that, that, that hit me. Out of the whole New York City, I'm sorry. Out of the entire New York City population, compared against one neighborhood in Harlem, whew. and as you can see, as time went on, the drug stuff increased. And I think if I'm not mistaken, the 60s era was the heroin era, which the heroin era, that heroin was coming from Asia. Okay. And was being routed supposedly and allegedly um, through the use of uh, military equipment. Okay, so I'm thinking of the uh, the Frank Lucas story, uh, the movie that Denzel played in. Okay, and heck, you can look at any drug epidemic in America, with the exception of uh, what we're going through now with the um, pharmaceutical drug error. But any other drug error, you can line it up with that particular drug being prevalent and it being some type of war going on. So meaning the drugs are being funneled heavily via a war. Okay. So in the 60s, you're talking Nam. So Asia. Okay, you get to the Afghanistan stuff. Um, that's heroin, if I'm not mistaken. It could be cocaine. Don't don't quote me on that. I think it's heroin, though, if I'm not mistaken. Poppy heroin, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, if you go to the crack cocaine era, we actually have hard facts on that. Um, that's going back to um, the Iran Contra illegal war is directly linked to the crack cocaine epidemic. Okay. You fast forward up to today 
And now it is the uh, pharmaceutical addiction uh, with Oxycontin and uh, I think Oxycontin is the main one epidemic. And that's strictly coming from the pharmaceutical companies, which now they've recently admitted it was purposely planned to cause that addiction. There is a good movie out on Hulu called Dope Sick. And it is literally going over the origins of the <coughs> pain prescription addiction in America. All right? But these numbers are highly, highly telling. Highly telling. So a lot of folk profited off of the addiction and death and ultimately destruction of black families via the drug trade. Okay? So again, are we going to have these serious conversations? Are we going to use the data, not only the data, use personal experiences and have honest conversations with these babies? Okay, let's continue. Okay, uh, so school integration has not occurred in the South where a decade after Brown versus Board of Education, only one black and nine is attending school with white children. And in the North, despite strenuous official efforts, neighborhoods and therefore schools are becoming more and more of one class and one color. In New York City, in the school year 1957 to 58, there were 64 schools that were 90% of more black or Puerto Rican. Six years later, there were 134 such schools. Okay, so it only increases what they're saying. Along with the diminution of white middle class contacts for a larger uh, percentage of uh, blacks, observers report that the black churches have all but lost contact with men in the northern cities as well. This may be a normal condition of urban life, but it is probably a change condition for the black American and cannot be socially desirable development. Okay. The only religious movement. Yeah, we went over there because it was shots fired, honey. The only religious movement that appears to have enlisted a considerable number of lower class black males in Northern cities of late is that of the black Muslims, a movement based on total rejection of white society even though it emulates whites more. Yep, we went over that because I said shots fired, honey, clutch pearls. In a word, the, ten, the, the tangle of pathology is tightening. Okay, and we did go over that. I apologize for those that have sat through that before. I guess I needed to go over it again. The case for national action. The object of this study has been to define a problem rather than propose solutions to it. Okay, now I'm going to throw in here, this is just me, my opinion, and I stand by it. It is not white society's responsibility. It's not white supremacy's responsibility to propose any solution to the black community. It is the black community's responsibility. I'll say that again so folk understand my position clear. It is not the white community, nor white supremacy, nor the white man's responsibility to propose solutions for the black community. It is the black community's responsibility. It is the black man's responsibility. We have kept, 
within these confines for three reasons. First, there are many persons within and without the government who do not feel the problem exists, at least in any serious degree. These persons feel that with the legal obstacles to assimilate out of the way, matters will take care of themselves in the normal course of events. This is a fundamental issue and requires a decision within the government. So the government don't feel that it's a problem, which we know that they do. Uh, Because remember, this was back in, what, 65. These persons that with the legal obstacles to assimilation out of the way. So in other words, they're saying either you assimilate into white society or let them kill each other off. Now, maybe I could I could be reading too much into the report. I could be reading too much into the report. That just could me be me thinking that. So again, it's not white supremacy, the government, the white man's responsibility to solve the black community, black people issues. And why as a black community, as black people, you would even think of or want a system that do not benefit you to solve your issues. What benefit would it be for them to solve your issues? Second, it is our view that the problem is so interrelated one thing with another that any list of program proposals would necessarily be incomplete and would distract attention from the main point of interrelatedness. We have shown a clear relation between male employment, for example, and the number of welfare dependent children. Uh huh. Mm hmm. So, hence, the government did not take the black man out the house via welfare. A clear relation between male employment and the number of welfare dependent children. Again, welfare did not take the black man out the home. Male employment, meaning lack thereof, or lack there not enough. Employment in turn reflects educational achievement, which depends in large part on family stability, which reflects employment. Um, just to go back over what they've said, In order to make a decent wage, you have to have a compatible trade, a compatible business slash entrepreneurship or education to get you into said compatible jobs. So earning a decent wage gives the black man a compatible advantage to be able to support a family which creates family stability. Where we should break into this cycle and how are the most difficult domestic questions facing the United States? We must first reach agreement on what the problem is. Then we will know what questions must be answered. 
Third, it is necessary to acknowledge the view held by a number of responsible persons that this problem may, in fact, be out of control. Child. Woo, hun hunty. They said a mouthful right there. <sighs> Third, it is necessary to acknowledge the view held by a number of responsible persons that this problem may in fact be out of control. This is a view with which we em empathetically and totally disagree, but the view must be acknowledged. The persistent rise in black educational achievement is probably the main trend that belies this thesis. On the other hand, our study has produced some clear indications that, that the situation may indeed have begun to feed on itself. It may be noted, for example, that for the most of the post-war period, Male, black unemployment, and the number of new welfare cases rose and fell together as if connected by a chain from 1948 to 1962. Let me go over this again for those black men that said welfare took the black men out of the home. For most of the post-war period, black men, unemployment, and the new welfare cases rose and fell together as if connected by a chain from 1948 to 1962. The correlation between the two series of data was an astonishing 0.91. That this would mean that 83% of the rise and fall in welfare cases can be statistically ascribed to the rise and fall in the unemployment rate. Again, welfare did not take black men out of the home. Unemployment or underemployment of black men caused black women to need welfare. In 1960, however, for the first time, unemployment declined, but the number of new welfare cases rose. In 1963, this happened a second time. In 1964, a third. The possible implications of these and other data are serious enough that they, too, should be understood before program proposals are made. Sorry about that. Oh, child. Child, I'm almost scared. <laughs> To see what they gonna come, what they gonna come up with. Child, my nerves, this, this is bad. However, the argument of this paper does not lead to one central conclusion. Whatever the specific elements of a national effort designed to resolve this problem, those elements must be coordinated in terms of one general strategy. What then is that problem? We feel the answer is clear enough. Three centuries of injustice have brought about deep-seated structural and dis distortions in the life of Black American. At this point, the present tangle of pathology is capable of perpetuating itself without existence from the white world. So in other words, Things are so out of control with the breakdown of the black family. The white man don't even have to be involved in that decline at all. Hmm. 
The cycle can be broken only if these distortions are set right. So again, white folks can't fix black folk problems. Black folk have to fix black folk problems. We know what black folk problems are. And if we don't know, it's our responsibility to know. In a word, a national effort towards the problem of black Americans must be directed towards the question of family structure. Chow. If I had a hundred dollars for every time I have said, if you can't control self, you can't control your family. If you can't control your family, you can't control your block slash neighborhood. If you can't control your uh, block slash neighborhood, you can't build and control a nation. The Negro family, so as to enable it to raise and support its members as other families. Okay. The object should be to strengthen the Negro family so as to enable it to raise and support its members as do other families. Now, again, <clears throat> if you say, Black families, Negro families, African-American families, indigenous American families, however the heck you want to state it. If you don't want to compare black families to other families, hey, I'm cool with that. That's, uh, hey, okay. But even with that said, what does that have to do with the broken state that said black families are in. Because with those other groups that folks don't want to compare themselves to, that are successful as a collective, their success can be linked to their families. Their success can be linked to the fathers being present in the household, the fathers being providers, the fathers being builders, the fathers being protectors. After that, how this group of Americans chooses to run its affairs take advantage of its opportunities or fail to do so is none of the nation's business. There you have it. So pretty much what I have been saying all up in there, that it's not white supremacy's responsibility. It's not the white community's responsibility. It's not the white man's responsibility to solve the black community, black people's problems as a collective. They pretty much telling you up in this report how this group of Americans chooses to run its affairs, take advantage of its, of its opportunities, or fail to do so is none of the nation's business. The fundamental importance and urgency of restoring the Black American family structure has been ev evident for some time. E. Franklin Frazier put it most succinctly in 1950. Okay, so hopefully I can finish this up. I'm telling you I can't make this up. <laughs> All types of interruptions. All right, so... The fundamental importance and urgency of restoring the Negro American family structure has been evident for some time, E. Franklin Frazier put in most succinctly in 1950. As a result of family disorganization, a large proportion of Negro, Negro children 
and youth have not undergone the socialization which one which only the family can provide the disorganized families have failed to provide for their emotional needs and have not provided the discipline and habits which are necessary for personality development. So now again, I'm just going to say, this is them comparing to white society. If the black community, if black men collectively want a different comparison then they must build an environment for different comparison or no comparison at all. Because the disorganized family has failed in its function as a socializing agency, it has handicapped the children in their relation to the institutions in the community. Moreover, family disorganization has been partially responsible for a large amount of juvenile delinquency and adult crimes among Blacks. Since the widespread family disorganization among Blacks has resulted from the failure of the father to play the role in family life required by American society. The mitigation of this problem must await those changes in the Negro and American society which will enable the Negro father to play the role required of him. Okay, now this last part, Negro and American society, and you can even take out American society. problem must await those changes in the Negro, which will enable the Negro father to play the role required of him. You can even strict out American society slash white society, strict that all the way out. And let's just focus on the role that is required of black fathers. Nothing was done in response to uh, Frazier's argument. Okay, so remember, Frazier is putting his argument forth back in the 1950s. Okay, matters were left to take care of themselves, and as matters will, grow worse, not better. Now, I'm going to say in the Black collective community, Matters were left for black women to take care of them. Now, I'm going to say matters were left for black women to take care of the absenteeism of black fathers. And they grew worse, not better. Now remember, this was Frazier saying this back in 1950. This report was put out in 65. That's 15 years. Let's flash forward to 2021. And it's still the same scenario with black fathers being absent in the household. Okay? And when I speak of in the household, let's be clear. It does not mean you have to be married and physically living in the household with your children versus being an active, healthy, participant father and raising and financially taking care of your children. That is what is lacking in the black community. And that issue, that problem has been left 
on black women to solve. And it's just gotten worse. The problem is now more serious. The obstacles greater. There is, however, a profound change for the better in one respect. The president has committed to the nation to an all-out effort to eliminate poverty wherever it exists amongst whites or blacks and a militant, organized, and responsible black movement exists to join in that effort. Let's back that up. Again, this is me speaking. I do not expect, nor is, the, it, is it the responsibility of the white supremacy or the white man or the white community to solve black community problems. So even if we take out what the white community or the white man or white supremacy says that they're going to do, What about the second part? A militant, organized, and responsible black movement exists to join in that effort. What about that second part? What happened with that second part? Yeah, that silence that you just heard, that's exactly what happened. And even with the infiltration, still what happened? Yeah, the silence that you heard, that's exactly what happened. Because again, change happens at the family level. So just like the black collective community cannot depend on white supremacy in a white system. They cannot uh, depend on a black movement as well. It has to start at the individual level and at the family level. Having strong core families then you can build at a black collective level. Such a national effort could be uh, stated thus. The policy of the United States is to bring the Negro American to full and equal sharing in the responsibilities and, uh, and rewards of citizenship. To this end, the programs of the federal government bearing on this objective shall be designed to have the effect directly or indirectly of enhancing the, the st blah, 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 of enhancing the stability and resources of the negro american family okay so again now this is just me it's not the responsibility of the white man the white supremacy system the white community to solve the collective black community problems. Okay. All right. So that's the end of this uh, particular report. <sighs> Again, uh, this report is The Case for National Action, The Negro Family. This was published in 1965 based on the Moen Hands Report. Uh, this was part five in the final phase in this particular series. Uh, once again, the purpose of this series was to just show you the pattern of the Black collective community and family and to show you the root issues within the black collective and the black community and to show you over these time periods of this report 1948 
I'm sorry, 1940 through 1963, how it was the same exact problems that face the black collective community today with the only exceptions that those same root issues, root problems are greater, okay? And finally, the purpose of this series is for each individual person to take this information and digest it and disseminate it not only within self, but to have serious conversations with your loved ones and the next generation, the babies, okay? So again, I do not expect anything from the white community, the government. It is not their responsibility to solve these problems. It is the black community, the black collective community to solve their own problems. And specifically within our own families. If we build healthy families, it will eliminate a lot of issues. In order to build healthy families, we have to have participant fathers. We have to have fathers that economically can support families. If we have black men that cannot support families, that means black men and black women should not be bringing forth children. Because if they do, that puts those children in a very high percentage of poverty, which leads to all of the other negative things. And at a minimum, if it doesn't lead them to those negative things, it leaves them at a serious disadvantage to compete in the white system. So with that said, family, thank you for being patient with me. I know I had to stop and start a few times. So uh, forgive me if it's um, throwing you off in any way. Um, if you enjoyed this content or if you found it of any value or use, um, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out our other content. Uh, you will see it's uh, a wide spectrum. So, uh, and I want to thank all of our supporters. Uh, you're truly appreciated. So this is Rhonda with WTUZ Radio Podcast. I wish everyone well on this Wednesday. Peace and love, family.